Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the Arab Gulf States Institute. My name is Steve Sesh. I'm the Executive Vice President, and we're delighted to be able to host you and our panelists for a discussion of a subject that is both timely and very important, uh, certainly given the ongoing events in Poland and the, the examination of exactly the implications of climate change and policies of the affected nations around the world. I think we can certainly expect to see a lot of good exchange here today. Uh, uh, we're very, very delighted to suddenly be able to have climate change as an issue that we are able to associate ourselves with. It is certainly a matter of national security for nations around the world in so many different ways, migration, population, uh, economic policies. And thanks to our fine panelists, and especially to Aisha al-Sarihi, uh, our visiting scholar who has brought climate change to our doorstep. Uh, and, and helped us understand it better and get smarter about it. We are able to host this and host you all, and I hope this will not be the last time we're able to do so. We'd like to continue the conversation in months to come uh, and hope we'll be able to get you back in those occasions. Um, I don't want to go any on any longer, so you can hear from our very distinguished panel. I will thank you again for coming. Turn us over to Samantha, our host, and we'll proceed from there. Thanks very much. Excellent. I'll echo his comments and thank you all for being here today. I'm just going to introduce our speakers really quickly. Um, you have their bios in front of you, so I won't belabor the introductions. We'll do a few minutes, 15 minutes or so from each speaker just to get an idea of where they come from and what they'd like to talk about, and then we'll open it up for discussion. So to my left, we have Harry Verhoeven. He teaches at the School of Foreign Services at Georgetown University and in Qatar and here in Washington. To my right, we have Colin Kelly, who is a senior research fellow at the Center for Climate and Security and at Columbia University. And to my far right, we have Aisha al-Sarihi, who is a visiting scholar here at the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington. So I'm going to turn it over to Harry to get us started. The floor is yours. So thank you, Samantha, and thank you also once again to the Institute and especially to Aisha for making it possible for me to, to be here with you, to join you for this important event. I'm delighted to be here, so thank you very much uh, for that. Um, so I think what I'll what I'll do as as the as the kind of the academic, if you like, on the on the um, on the panel is to um, speak a bit about the ways in which we think about what um, climate change is and what may be different ways of understanding the linkages between the environment, uh, economic development, and and politics. But the photo you see up here is a photo taken in what is officially the most polluted town in the world, it's a city in the eastern part of Iran, the city of Zabol, which has the highest concentration of fine particular uh, matter uh, anywhere in the world. And uh, depending on your, on your viewpoint, on the way you think about these linkages between environmental change, especially climate change, economic development and politics, the way in which people characterize Zabol and what the problem is, why more than 600 people die every year of tuberculosis, which is directly induced by the air pollution that you find in the city. In many ways, that, that characterization reveals an awful lot about their assumptions, not just about the environment, but very importantly about human beings, about who, what human beings are and what essentially drives them and compels them uh, to do. Now, in the narration, for example, of the Iranian government and most uh, international organizations that work on the ball and on the situation there, this is essentially a problem of urban planning. The reason why uh, pollution levels in the ball in eastern Iran are so high is also because of very nefarious consumption patterns. Zabal has a growing population that is unfortunately irresponsible in the way it uses the resources in the, in the city as well as in, in, in surrounding uh, areas. And the obvious solution for this is, of course, an improvement in regulation. It's putting constraints and incentives so that people start behaving in different ways and that you get this terrible problem of air pollution uh, sorted. Now, a second more pessimistic narrative, if you like, one that doesn't just assume that people will fall in line if you provide the right kind of laws, regulations, which are based in science, is a narrative that increasingly associates the ball with very negative migration. And this is a story that's mainly told by a number of people in the bigger cities in Iran who have seen a large number of people moving from Zabal to these bigger cities and in which the, the migrants from Zabal are essentially blamed uh, for increasing urban uh, problems there too. They're, so to speak, taking their bad consumptive habits with them and their bad ways of, uh, of behaving themselves. And in that sense, they're foreshadowing what is already happening, namely that things like water scarcity, air pollution, maybe even climate change, is leading to instability, to crime, perhaps even to conflict and war uh, elsewhere. 
Now, a third way of looking at this, and the way uh, I think that I'll be talking most about, is a way that actually highlights the much greater, much more important structural forces that explain why the ball is uh, in the state that it is in. It would, for example, be worth highlighting that eastern Iran, of which the ball is an important part, has for years been marginalized by the Iranian government. And that for decades there has been underinvestment in agriculture, which leads people in this part of Iran, in, in, of Iran to use certain uh, types of, um, of, of consumption, uh, com consumptive uh, techniques. Very similarly, it may be worth pointing out that part of the reason why water is managed as poorly as it is in Zabal is because most of the water never that, that, that Zabal is by the, by the Helmand River, which it shares with, with Afghanistan, is actually drained by poppy farmers in Afghanistan for the growing uh, of poppy, which of course, as you know, is gets served into opium and then ultimately in, into heroin. It may also be worth pointing out that Zabal has been disproportionately affected by US sanctions. And that part of the reason why people use antiquated equipment and, and for example, why spare parts are lacking is because of the imposition of US sanctions and the inability to get spare parts and access to modern technologies. That too is potentially part of the explanation why Zabal is the state is in. So what I'm trying to do and what the overview I'm trying to give you is that the environment, which is often in the Middle Eastern context, in the Gulf context, assumed to be some kind of exogenous variable that explains itself. If you like in the very famous metaphor of Egypt, Egypt as a gift of the Nile as if the fact that the Nile uh, flows from Lake Tana in Ethiopia and Lake Victoria in equatorial Africa all the way to Egypt, and it makes its way through the Sahara Desert, is self-explanatory of the kind of social and political outcomes it has. And the moment you start actually thinking about it, you understand that it's not that easy and not that simple. Yet what is striking that is in the, in the way we approach environmental issues, like for example climate change or water scarcity or food scarcity, we continue to hang on to these extremely simplistic narratives of environmental change in the way they interact with social and, and political variables. A great example of this is, of course, the, the famous development economist Jeffrey Sachs, who has long been, been suggesting that we approach questions of sustainability of environmental change uh, as, quote, a profession of rigor, insight, and practicality. And essentially, the understanding here is a very positivist understanding of science. That is the belief that facts and values can and should always be separated, should be analytically quarantined that there is something as a process of the cumulative accumulation of knowledge, and that that's fundamentally a good thing, that there's a number of experts who can understand that knowledge and who can then implement it. And there's a strong feeling that ordinary people and all kinds of other people may be well-meaning, but are often very often misguided in the way they do this, and that therefore decision-making should by and large be left to experts who then design institutions and rules and regulations and incentives, as we saw in the first example of uh, the problem in, in Zabal. Now the second tradition, the second example I gave you, that, that dystopian narrative of growing instability and migration and conflict also has much older and much deeper roots. And essentially, as many of you will know, it goes back to the thinking of the English reverend Thomas Malthus, who very famously predicted that the Earth's ability to generate enough resources for us, in this case, especially food, and the growth of human population were not commensurate. And that human population essentially grows at a geometric rate whereas the production of food increases only arithmetically, and that therefore there is a point, there's limits to growth, and after, those, after that point is reached, the only way you can essentially control environmental problems is through what he called the negative checks, huh? famine, war, and disease. And so in that sense, people who, who think in this, in this vein very often subconsciously draw on the, uh, the kind of Hobbesian uh, metaphor of the, uh, of the tragedies of the commons. And in the context of the Middle East, imagine a water well, and that we have somewhere that we all share as a, as a community. Now, there is no uh, rules and regulations set around the water well. There's just the assumption that all of us, because we come from the same tribe, will use it within measure. But the problem is, of course, at least in this parable, that each of us has an individual incentive to take out as much water as we possibly can. Now, as you all begin to notice that I'm increasingly taking out my share of the water, you begin to feel, well, I should be doing the same thing. I'm not going to just sit there until Harry has used up all the water. I should proactively move. Now the problem is therefore that you're in an institutional in environment where on an individual level it makes perfect sense to engage in rampant consumption, but of course for the group as a whole this is catastrophic. And the moment we realize that it's happening we often resort to violence, or at least that's the, that's the story. And hence of course the dystopian narratives of climate wars or water wars, which you often find associated with the Middle East and, and, and the Gulf.
But a third way of thinking, and as I said, I think a much more productive way, and also one that's, I think, empirically and analytically much richer, is to not think that somehow either the politics are all benign or the politics are utterly dystopian, but it is to ask real questions about the ways in which we represent environmental problems and the ways in which we think about how knowledge is constructed and what we think we know, and who is speaking on behalf of whom. And ultimately, the way I think about climate change, whether in the Gulf or in other places, is ultimately as a distributional question, as a question that is a discussion about authority, about participation, about who speaks on behalf of whom, who gets to make claims, whose claims are downplayed, and whose claims are strengthened. And to give you a very simple example, remember a few years ago the protests that happened in Turkey around Gezi Park. As you may, as you may remember, there was a, uh, there's a park on the European side of Istanbul, Gezi Park, Taksim Gezi Park which the Erdogan government proposed a few years ago to convert into a mall as well as a series of houses and, and, and shopping, uh, and shopping um, <coughs> uh, spaces. Um, and as protests arose against that decision to, to transform this park into, into this commercial area, very quickly the protesters were criminalized. We were told that these were essentially bourgeois kids who had nothing better to do than to smoke weed in the park there and to hang out with the same sex and do all kinds of things that you shouldn't be doing in Erdogan's Turkey, and that therefore this really was a completely illegitimate form of protest, and we shouldn't pay too much attention to it. What was striking is that almost immediately activists put out the following pamphlet. It's, it's, it's there on the right, and I think it's extremely revealing, and it's, it's very instructive to think about the environment, politics, and society in more fruitful ways. As the activist says, this is not a part of park. The fact that, yes, we care about the only green space in this part of town is important in and of itself, but there's a much wider debate here. What we're fundamentally in the streets for, and this is also why millions of people then, in, as a result, poured out into, this, into other Turkish cities, as well as into neighboring uh, countries like in, like in Greece, huh, was to say, fundamentally, the discussion about the park is a discussion about involvement. It's about the right to be heard, it's about the right to be on board, and to have a say in the forces, environmental, social, political, that are shaping our lives. It's about the systematic abuse of state power whenever we try to have a different narrative of environmental or economic or social change. It's about minorities not being protected. In this case, this park was an ancient Armenian burial ground. It was also frequented a lot by, Tur by Kurdish people. They would say, this is not a coincidence. These are the very kind of people who are not wanted in Erdogan's Turkey. Now, for me, it's not important whether that's actually true or not. I'm not trying to, have a, to start a polemic here about Gezi Park. What is important is to understand that these activists, very rightly so, said that to try to separate the social, the political, and the economic from the environmental is absolutely nonsensical. And that brings me to my final remarks about, about the Gulf and about climate change, which is that it's, I don't think it's, it's very useful to necessarily say that Gulf states should do more, or they should do less, or to throw your hands up, or to try to follow a kind of Jeffrey Sachs-like scenario in which you believe that better communication if only we explain things better and we send more experts, that that will solve, quote unquote, the problem. The issue at hand here, fundamentally for me, is not, a, is not an issue of miscommunication or misunderstanding. It's about a fundamental misalignment or a fundamental confrontation of interests. And one of the best ways of illustrating this, of one of the, the reasons why you, why you are faced with situations like, like this in which as you can, I don't know if you can read it, but it's the Gulf states are at the very right-hand side here of, of situations with, of absolute water scarcity, which we know due to climate change is gonna get even worse. But we're at the same time, you have situations like this where the water bills or the bills for energy or for a range of other things in the Gulf states are the very lowest in the world. Now you cannot understand this. I mean, you could call this irrational and say, well, we should inform that this is wrong, but you cannot understand this unless you understand that citizenship in the Emirates, in Saudi Arabia, in Bahrain, in Qatar, is fundamentally premised on the ability of the state to give those kind of subsidies. The way in which consumption uh, patterns are formed is fundamentally part of the social contract that rulers have with their own nationals. If you want to have a conversation about changing those consumption habits, you're having a fundamentally political conversation. You're having a conversation that's ultimately about widening political participation and changing the social contract. And unless you're willing to engage in that, and that, as I said, is often an adversarial and confrontational process, it's not a process in which I will just illuminate you and now you will understand and be thankful to me, <laughs> we're not going to, 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 be, to be getting anywhere. And so I wanted to leave you with these, with these kind of provocative thoughts at the outset. I think you know, fundamentally the conversation about climate change 
is a political conversation. I think political in the good sense of the word rather than the bad sense. I know I'm in, I'm in DC. I know that the word politics is increasingly polarized in and of, polarizing in and of itself. Uh, but I think fundamentally, unless one is willing to talk about authority, about power, about who speaks for whom and who makes certain claims, and the ways in which citizenship operates, it's going to make very, be very difficult to make any progress on the more technical issues that I guess many people care about. Thanks, Harry. Next, I'll hand it over to Colin. Uh, thank you, Harry. <coughs> Excuse me. And thank you to the Institute and to my fellow panelists for having this discussion. I'm pleased to be involved with it. Um, I think Harry did an excellent job of setting the table for a lot of these uh, concepts, some of which I'll be kind of following those threads. Um, I am a, a research scientist. I work for Columbia University, specifically the International Research Institute for Climate and Society. And our institute is very much concerned with the links between climate, not only climate change, but climate variability, forecasting, its relationship to agriculture and other sectors, uh, and to health concerns. And so that's a, a big part of, of what I'm involved with. And we work internationally in a lot of different countries, specifically or particularly in Africa and also in Asia, trying to work directly uh, and emphasize stakeholder engagement with the research that we do. Um, I'm also affiliated with the Center for Climate and Security, and uh, I became involved with them through some work that I did looking at uh, the Eastern Mediterranean and Syria and the relationships with food and water security there, and ultimately the, the conflict that occurred. So coming back to this discussion, I want to kind of set the stage and say that when we think about climate, I think we all know that we're dealing with a very arid climate here. That's no surprise to anyone here, and that temperatures have been rising steadily and that we expect with high confidence that that trend is going to continue throughout this region, throughout the greater Middle East, and point out that this is going to, uh, you know, deleteriously affect soil moisture. Uh, rainfall trends, however, vary uh, widely throughout the region. There are some places that are getting drier, and there are some places where there's little or no uh, significant rainfall trend. But another really important uh, consideration and a trend uh, that's, that's very important is the uh, falling groundwater levels, that the aquifers have been declining, and that this is not so much related to climate change or climate variability, but rather to overuse, and that these, uh, this has been largely, uh, largely considered. So before we consider the impacts of climate-related factors, it's very important to consider, I feel, the context for overall vulnerability in any given place or region. So when we think about vulnerability, um, uh, the Gulf uh, Cooperation Council countries, Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, uh, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and UAE, are highly vulnerable to, in particular, and this is what I'll mostly talk about today, food imports volatility. Population has grown exponentially in these countries, particularly in Saudi Arabia, and the growth in the GCC countries is projected to increase, have increased by 30% from 2000 levels to 2020. A 30% increase in the population in a 20 year period, which is an enormous increase in the demand for resources. So the result, as I said, is the much higher demand for resources and there has been a very strong dependence uh, in recent decades on imported food staples and that dependence has actually just been increasing significantly. So food imports are projected to continue and to grow. Some of the major factors during the GCC market or driving the GCC market include growing domestic and expat population, um, rising health consciousness among the population, changing tastes and preferences, and growing disposable income leading to higher consumption of nutritional foods as part of a stable diet, a healthier diet. There are efforts, active efforts underway toward purchasing more fruits and vegetables in particular. So an over-reliance on these imports and rising soil salinity in particular um, were uh, very important considerations, especially for fruit and vegetable market. The region's dependence on desalinated water means that the, uh, meeting more of its food needs through domestic production is not really a viable alternative for the long term. So Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Kuwait, and Egypt last year were the largest markets for fresh produce imports. The Saudis and the UAE account for over 2% of global fresh produce imports. And Saudi Arabia fresh produce imports are growing at a faster rate than global imports in the last five years. So these are really important converging trends that have to be considered. 
before you even really start to consider some other factors. So who are the primary suppliers of these growing import markets for the Middle East? In total, the Middle East as a whole is a net fresh produce exporter. About 40% of the fresh produce imports are supplied by other Middle Eastern countries, with Egypt and Turkey being two of the largest, but various other countries supply the rest. The growing markets for fresh produce in Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Kuwait have increased supply from various countries that include South Africa, Europe, Latin America, and the Asia Pacific region, including Australia and India. So very much an international supply chain from many places. So bringing this back to climate, we know that climate-related shocks can occur due to climate variability before we even start to consider climate change and, and these long-term trends. And that's a large part of what I'm involved with and my institute is involved with is considering climate variability on different time scales and being able to help these countries and these regions try to build resilience in the, in the climate information that they have and the climate forecast that they use and what we call climate services. So it's important to point out that climate impacts for, for these regions and for these nations, uh, as for many other regions, extend well beyond their own borders. When you think about security, you're not just thinking about the security in these countries. You're thinking about how secure the countries are due to some of these other factors that they trade with, which is extremely important, especially when they have such a strong reliance on these products. So some suggestions I would make would say that food security depends on research, obviously. Uh, decision making, better decision making, which is a, a strong emphasis of my institute, uh, stakeholder engagement, working with the National Met Services, the Agricultural Services, uh, the World Food Program, other international agencies to try and build resilience in these countries related to these issues, and international cooperation. Um, recently, I went and spent a week doing a short course in Bangladesh uh, for a recently created Academy of Climate Services that we helped. Uh, or create and, and, uh, and produce a short course involving some of these stakeholders, the, the Met Service there and the Ag Service and other services, and it brought together stakeholders from throughout Bangladesh from different sectors, not only agriculture. And it was about trying to walk them through the decision-making process and say, what are the products that you've been using? What are the tools that you've used to make these decisions uh, on shorter time scales up to uh, annual time scales? And to say, well, are you aware of these other products? And if you, if you had gaps in your knowledge or your understanding, uh, how can we fill those and how can we work together to, to create research and create better monitoring or better products to, to do this? And one of, the, one of the important things that we found was that even for the products that were produced nationally in that country by their own meteorological department, which is quite capable, that a lot of the, the sectors there or the people representing those sectors were unaware of some of these products and were very happy for the opportunity to have this engagement with the Met Service, which they uh, had not had in the past and would very much like to have. So that was a major step forward. And we were able to um, talk about next steps and move forward in that regard. So that was quite productive. So this is just an example of the kinds of things that we talk about when we talk about climate services. Um, I want to reemphasize that regional stability is very much uh, mutually beneficial and often depends on water and food security, again, not only in these countries specifically, but in the other countries. Um, and sometimes, as I mentioned with the, the food imports coming from far and wide, very much related to the climate variability and the shocks that are occurring in those countries. And therefore, the importance of being able to, to better forecast and to better understand what's happening in those countries. Uh, strengthening relationships with the other countries with respect to building resilience and food and water security would pay large dividends for everyone involved. And this can be incorporated within the context of the overarching goal of economic diversification that we know is already uh, happening in this, in, in this region and is, is expected to continue. Uh, so it's very much about the, the vulnerability. I think is the context is very important for not only climate change, for climate variability, but also to think that this is, this is not only a problem for the countries that we're talking about, but for all of the countries that they deal with and even uh, countries that they may not be dealing with now, but might be in the future. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Colin. Aisha, it's all yours. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Colin. Um, on my turn, I'm going to focus on the Gulf Arab states uh, and the domestic governance of the climate change. 
I'm going to uh, highlight on the challenges and opportunities for addressing climate change in line with the economic diversifications in the Gulf. And then I'm going to end with some uh, recommendations on what options are available for the Gulf countries to both advance the economic diversification, but to be more climate resilient uh, in a future, future by uh, low carbon, zero carbon economies. So the Gulf Arab states have been, for a long time, six decades or so, um, defined by the oil and gas wealth. Uh, oil and gas export revenues have, for decades, contributed to the um, economic stability of the Gulf countries. Um, however, the narrow uh, export profile uh, made the Gulf countries uh, uh, and the economic stability uh, directly linked to the oil prices. Uh, today, I'm focusing on the climate change and how climate change is affecting the economic stability. Um, climate change uh, presents an additional challenge to the economic stability of the Gulf countries because it's affecting both the economic, uh, the, the oil and non-oil economic sectors. In terms of the non-oil economic sectors, as Colin highlighted uh, just now, uh, the increase in average uh, surface temperature, the decrease in the annual rainfall, the rise uh, in the sea level, these are already affecting the non-oil uh, sectors such as the infrastructure, agriculture, water, uh, fishery, and uh, tourism, and so on. And we have already seen some extreme events uh, hitting the Gulf countries uh, like in Jeddah, Qatar, and uh, Kuwait. At the same time, climate change also offer an, or present an additional challenge to the uh, oil-based economic sector. In particular, um, the global efforts to tackle climate change, and it has been made evident from many studies, uh, including the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, it is evident that fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas, are uh, representing more than 70% uh, of global greenhouse gas emissions, and therefore future access to uh, fossil fuels should be concentrated to keep the global, uh, the increase in global average temperature well below two degrees Celsius, or more ambitiously, to well below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Therefore, uh, the global efforts to cut uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the form of renewable energy, energy efficiency, carbon prices, fossil fuel subsidy reforms, the adoption of electric vehicles can potentially contribute in changing the dynamics and the conditions of the oil market uh, in the future. And in fact, we have already seen in the OECD uh, a peak in the oil demand between uh, 2003 and 2005. Maybe there are going to be some argument here, but yeah, and that is including in the U.S., Japan, and the EU, uh, which are the main destinations of the Gulf uh, oil and gas exports. At the same time, there are several studies, including the International Energy Agency, that expect that that global energy consumption um, is going to continue uh, to grow and especially from non-OECD, like from China and India. But I think uh, this expectation uh, need to be taken more cautiously. And uh, because in China and India, we see increasing efforts to uh, address climate change and to reduce carbon intensity uh, reduction. Uh, there are lots of energy efficiency programs, uh, uh, lots of investments on renewable energy. In India, for example, yeah. there is a, India have a 15% target to have uh, electric vehicles uh, on the streets and increase that target to 30% by 2030. Therefore, I think climate change and oil prices need to be, uh, cannot be viewed separately. They need to be looked at uh, at the same time. For decades, the economic diversification have been discussed in the Gulf countries, and most notably after the recent drop in oil prices in 2014. 
And we have seen several economic reforms, including uh, the reform of the fossil fuel subsidies and the value added tax, and so on. Uh, in terms of the climate change, the Gulf countries have been for, for a long time actively involved in global climate change negotiations since the 1990s. And we, um, I mean, the Gulf countries have recently uh, signed and ratified the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement. They have also submitted the nationally determined contribution in which they are listing the uh, mitigation and adaptation ambitions. But how the scene looks like in the domestic level, this is what I'm going to focus on. At the domestic level, um, well, in the Gulf countries, there are several uh, climate-related initiatives. We see lots of uh, increasing in the investments in the renewable energy, energy efficiency, and investigation of the potential of carbon ca capture and utilization technology for enhanced oil recovery. Um, if we look at the whole picture, however, and uh, look closely to those climate-related initiatives, yes, they are promising. However, they are small in scale. They are fragmented. Um, and I think um, because of the abundance of the oil and gas over the last few decades have uh, actually distracted the attention uh, toward investing in those alternative energy options. And if we look at renewable energy at the moment, uh, renewable energy does not account for more than 1% of total energy supply and consumption in the Gulf countries. Today, um, in terms of climate change, well, only Oman and the UAE have established national climate action plans. And this is important to have an action plan rather than just have a nationally determined contribution which uh, is important to translate those intention into an action on the ground. Another point that I would like to highlight on is that climate change and uh, economic diversification are viewed separately. Climate change at the moment is not in the top uh, agenda of political and economic uh, discussions. And where in cases that climate-related matters are included in the economic development plans, like for example, there is a 130 million ton reduction of CO2 emissions in Saudi Vision 2030. And then there is, uh, for example, 20% of renewable energy target in the UAE 2021, uh, uh, Vision 2021. Uh, my concern is that they are m highly focused on the energy sector, and this can the development on the energy sector can be at the expense of the other sectors which are also affected by the climate change. So, all of that I think can be attributed to um, fundamental challenges that are existing uh, on the ground in the Gulf countries, and through my research over the last two years or so. And my, to, uh, through my talk to the colleagues in Oman, UAE, and Saudi Arabia, um, the main challenges uh, can be classified into three challenges. Uh, the first one is the data availability. Now, in terms of climate change, um, sometimes, yes, the data are available. But in most cases, the available data are inconsistent. Uh, they are not systematic. They are, there is high level of uncertainty. Um, and this is mainly uh, because of the uh, fragmentation and coordination process of uh, collecting, monitoring, and validating data. Um, the, the data collection in the Gulf uh, in terms of climate change are made in based on an ad hoc, ad hoc process, depending on the needs uh, to respond to the UN requirements, such as um, communicating the national communication or through the update of national determined contribution. Uh, the second challenge is institutional in nature. Um, we have um, centrality and heavy involvement of the Ministry of Energy and the energy industry to address the climate change in the Gulf. Um, this, is, this can be useful 
because uh, the climate change is affecting the main uh, source of income in the Gulf countries. But as I mentioned before, it can be at expense of other important sectors, and it can create bias in the decision making uh, oriented toward the advantage of the oil and gas sector. Um, it can eliminate the representation of other ministries, which also has uh, have roles to address climate uh, change in, for example, in terms of the, its effect on agriculture, water, etc. Um, another uh, institutional challenge, like if in, there are some cases where the Ministry of Environment have a role to address the climate change, but in those cases, um, we see that the Ministry of the Environment um, have a negligible role to um, affect the decision making. Um, and through my observation, it's mainly because of the capacity uh, of those ministries and uh, therefore the government doesn't really have a confidence on the, uh, you know, the ministries of the environment. And um, as I, I don't know if I mentioned this before, there is in many Gulf countries, there is a lack of climate action plan and therefore we see fragmentations uh, in efforts to address the climate change. Um, and then the third challenge is finance. Uh, of course, addressing climate change requires finance. And through my talk to colleagues in the region, uh, many has emphasized that finance is not an issue for the Gulf countries to address the climate change. Uh, the, the challenge is the allocation of the finance. And as I mentioned, all of those uh, challenges of data, knowledge, information, these are misinforming the decision making in regards of uh, factoring climate change in the sectoral planning and development. And in, in many cases as well, we see uh, that climate change uh, forced to put extra burden on the state budget, especially um, because of the uh, flash, recent flash floods, for example. So yeah, so um, now I think all of this discussion is begging the question, uh, okay, so what are the options are available for the Gulf countries to um, both advance the economic diversification, but also uh, ensure a climate resilient uh, future. Um, I would like to highlight here that uh, the Gulf countries have a huge potential to make the transition uh, to a low carbon future. Um, especially in terms of uh, or from the energy perspective, it has a huge potential of alternative energy resources, <coughs> especially the renewables uh, such as the solar and wind, and there are some other uh, alternative uh, resources which are not discovered yet. But the challenge is more, or the question is more about how to tap those potentials and uh, how to unlock uh, the investments on alternative um, resources. Uh, and as I mentioned before, it is actually the, this abundance of fossil fuels just attracted the uh, attention towards developing those alternatives. So the first thing, uh, I think uh, the challenge for the Gulf countries is to facilitate the uh, transition from state on enterprise to private enterprise and to empower the small medium enterprises and the uh, public private enterprises. This in terms, for example, of renewable, it will enable the penetration of uh, the new technologies such as the renewable energy and energy efficiency technologies. And it would allow more of the competition in the market. Uh, nowadays, uh, the markets uh, in, around the Gulf countries are monopolized highly monopolized uh, and it eliminates the competition really in the market. And the other thing, uh, well, the big thing, uh, keeping fossil fuel in the ground. This is, this is not gonna be a viable, uh, viable option for the Gulf countries. It is gonna be a very difficult option. Um, we have already seen in terms of economic diversification and expansion of the uh, downstream industry and the petrochemical industries. 
Um, I think that is a good thing, but uh, what I want to highlight on or to focus, uh, to uh, emphasize on is to make sure that those investments are done under high environmental standards so they can make the Gulf region more competitive in future uh, energy markets. Um, one important thing that I would like to bring is the integration of the climate change science and the um, the studies of uh, alternative making alternative technology businesses in the uh, education curriculum, both at the school level and the university level, so that we can prepare the new generation to uh, be competitive in new uh, markets. Um, else. Yeah, and in terms of the, the data, uh, data uh, availability problem, I think we need to do more, uh, like, I mean, in terms of research and to or coordinate the data collection uh, and, and maximize the collaboration, actually, between the universities and the government institutions. Um, And yeah, for the Gulf countries, they don't need actually to start from zero in terms of addressing the climate change. The Gulf countries can advantage from the institutional settings of uh, economic diversification, but they need to ensure that we are factoring climate change in the sectoral planning and development. And finally, I would like to end up with saying that um, we need to shift the thinking in the Gulf that Climate change is a threat to the economy. We need to think more about the links between climate change and the economy and how we can tap more in the co-benefits and the advantages and uh, opportunities that come uh, from it. Thank you. Thanks to everyone. I had, this has been a good summary, starting from going from the very macro at level issues about climate all the way down to micro and what the Gulf countries should do. I have a couple of questions that I'll pose to the, to the um, speakers here, and then maybe I'll open it up for questions from you all. And I'll start with Harry, starting from, from macro and going micro. <laughs> um, I definitely hear your point about context contextualizing climate and moving it and understanding that it's a social and a political issue. But it also seems to me, and I often describe this way, it this way in my own work, that climate is just the ultimate tragedy of the commons mm -hmm. problem. How do you go from, from something that really actually is a Malthusian climate tragedy, the commons problem, into something that's more, that's, m that's able to be contextualized and mm -hmm. able to be dealt with you know, at the levels where you actually need to meet people politically? OK. Do you, you want to ask everybody or? Just, just my, my I kind of have a joint one too, so I'll leave oh, that All right. Um, well, yes, in, in, in a sense, indeed, climate is the, is the ultimate one. It's, it's perhaps the most existential one, certainly, at the, at the planetary level. Um, but I would say that's why it's just all the more important to have this emphasis on, uh, emphasis on participation and on authority and including voices and on, on debates about accountability, because there is that much at stake. Um, I think it's even more dangerous, and again, I, I'm aware that I'm saying this in Washington, D.C., but just to leave it to the experts. Um, because, I mean, take for example, again, in the Gulf, there's been no shortage of consultants, of researchers, of advisors, of all kinds of people who've been going there. And I, 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 I would differ a bit with perhaps what Aisha said. I think, Aisha, you're absolutely right to say, of course, you know, the data can always be improved. I've never heard a scientist say to me, well, we have, we have more than enough data, we don't need any more studies. It's highly unlikely. The reason, for example, why environmental ministries are weak in the UAE, in Saudi Arabia, in Kuwait, etc., in my understanding, is not because of the paucity of the data or the, the, the weakness of the people who work there. It's because they're politically disempowered. And why are they politically disempowered? Because what they say and what they propose could potentially be very threatening. And so you know, if, if, if the idea is indeed that you know, this is an existential challenge, it is more important than ever before to build those coalitions, to reach out to all kinds of people. And, you know, Colin was giving some great examples of what he's been doing in, in Bangladesh with a range of stakeholders, and I, and I assume this also includes ordinary Bangladeshis who are ultimately the people who will have to, who will have to do it. I mean, on, on less than until one understands that changing consumption behavior and consumption patterns is not just a question, again, of, of advice and communication, but it's essentially getting people to reflect 
on the power they have or the lack of power and the ways in which they've been excluded. I mean, is deforestation a local or a global problem? It, an awful lot depends on the way you, you frame that and where you, you put the responsibility. And so, again, for climate change, I think more, more important than ever before in the Gulf as well as elsewhere is, is to build those coalitions. It's to broaden that conversation. It is not just to keep it um, for a handful of people, etc., but to, to have that fundamental conversation about transformation. And to point out that this is not just a, a transformation in terms of the technologies we use or the ways in which we build our cities, but it's the way we think about ourselves and the way we treat other human beings. And unless and until you get, you get to that, I'm afraid that there will be both a lot of environmental destruction and an incredible amount of social injustice that, come, that go hand in hand with it. Because as you know very often, it is not a coincidence that the victims of one are also the victims of the other. In any earthquake, in any flood, who are the people most likely to die, you think? Why are people living in certain places that makes them vulnerable? I mean, Colm spoke a lot about vulnerable and vulnerability and resistance. Absolutely. The question is, why are certain people able to be resilient? And why are pe certain people get permanently vulnerable? Why are they easily pushed over the abyss, right? When drought strikes or when climate comes along. This is not an act of God. This is not the exogenous variable, to put it in good scientific language. This is eminently endogenous. There's a reason this was created by men, and therefore it can be solved by men. But again, the idea that we, that we need a bit more consultancy and a bit more talking and expert advice, it's, it's welcome, but it won't get to the heart of the matter, not for people and not for the environment. Can I ask you that of course, okay. absolutely. Yeah, so I think um, I am actually brought to the awareness campaigns. So I think in the Gulf countries in particular, uh, you know, this um, fossil fuels wealth and then we have this uh, fossil fuel subsidies. These have contributed for a long time in the, this high consumption behavior in the Gulf countries. And it's really, it's not that easy to change uh, like this behavior that quickly. Um, so it is really tricky in, in the way the subsidy reforms uh, can be done in the Gulf countries. Uh, it's certainly gonna like, uh, make some uh, problems in terms of uh, income inequality. Um, so my thinking is that the way it can be done is to focus on the large consumers, uh, like the industry commercial sectors, uh, uh, in terms of removing the subsidies. It can then, in a way, send a signal to the other segments of the society that uh, we also maybe uh, are going to have and I have seen this in Oman. Uh, the, the individuals and the households see that maybe it's coming to us as well. Uh, so at the same time, what the government can do if it plans also to remove the subsidies from the uh, individuals and the households, it can uh, it, like intervene with the awareness campaigns uh, before removing those subsidies. So that would help in changing uh, the behavior. Yeah, thank you. If I can, I'd like to build on that thought because it actually comes to the question that I was thinking of for you, and that is, we, I can't remember if this was here or whether it was in the room before the meeting where we were talking about um, the relationship of citizens with their governments and the fact that these governments are set up such that they're, they're, they exist in many ways to spread oil wealth, to yep. take the rents from natural resources and give them to the citizens, and that's been their role for a really long time. How? How do governments start to change their relationship with citizens to change the structure of the economy, to change the uh, to to change things like subsidies? Like it seems like it's not just we're not going to subsidize oil or water anymore. It's about our relationship with you is changing. Yes. It's a deeper thing exactly. than just changing exactly. a subsidy. How do you go about that? And particularly, how do you go about that in, in non-democratic systems? <laughs> This is not an easy question, and this may be a question that people in the audience can comment on as well, but I feel like it's kind of the, the root core of, of, of a challenge. Totally, to give a very quick and simple example, um, when you talk about climate change and adapting to climate change, for example, in the Gulf, 70% of water use in the UAE and Qatar is by agriculture, whilst only a percent, if that, of people in these countries are actually employed in the agricultural sector without even going to the issue of who is employed there, the wages, the conditions in which they work, et cetera. Is that a coincidence that you have this total mismatch and the kind of subsidies I put up? Of course not. There is a direct link between that and the political usefulness of discourses about food self-sufficiency. What is food security? Food security for whom? Yeah. Right? Okay. 
There's, there's, there's a direct link there. There's, 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 there's a direct transfer of assets from some people to other people. Unless one is able and, and willing to talk about it, and that's a very difficult thing, of course, in these societies, and that's why I, I, I'm not underestimating the magnitude of the challenge. I'm, 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 I'm quite worried by that. But I think we have to state that magnitude of the challenge because otherwise we're, we're kidding ourselves and we're not doing anyone a favor, least of all those who will have the hardest time, who are already living with climate change, the hardest time adapting to it. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to be very honest about the magnitude of the challenge and not say, oh, why don't you just remove those subsidies? It's much more complicated than that. It's, it, you know, it sounds like an easy thing to do, but it's not. I almost think about that uh, transition you know, away from these subsidies and that kind of thing is uh, as a kind of an economic diversification of its own. But you're, instead of diversifying to different sectors or to different places, you're more uh, diversifying to the scale, mm -hmm. essentially. And that's important, right? Because mm -hmm. we can all, I think, agree that they've been over-reliant on, on these subsidies to the point that it make it even more difficult to change, but that it's really important to do so. But how to do that is, yeah. is very much a challenge. Yeah, maybe I can, maybe I can add the point Maybe the government can engage the citizens uh, in this process through the empowerment of the small medium enterprises, I think, not only in the climate related issues, but in the other uh, issues, uh, open up the market. And I have seen, like, I have seen actually in the Gulf it's happening. Uh, uh, there are still some challenges uh, for those small medium enterprises, but now, uh, the young generation are not pursuing the same jobs that the older generation have been pursuing, like uh, going into the government. Um, but they are trying to go into this route of small, medium enterprises. Um, yeah. <laughs> what source of hope? <laughs> I have one more question I'll throw out, and then I'll open it up. And that's for you, Colin. Mm -hmm. So we've talked a bit, all of us up here, I think have hit on it at some point, about really that the ministries of energy and the energy industry is where the action at, is at in these countries. And so that's, that's why they're powerful. That's why they're, they're dealing mostly with climate. But on the other hand, there's a lot of other really important things that, are, that could be happening in these countries as a result of climate change. You focused on food insecurity. I've thought a lot, I mean, you hear about places that might become so hot and humid that they're borderline uninhabitable mm -hmm. if climate change continues. I mean, mm -hmm. we're talking about some serious questions. How do you move the conversation in these areas beyond energy into things like adaptation and trade and other issues that, that are going to be really important? Yeah, and that's a really good question. I mean, it's a real challenge because um, when, when you consider these things, you can't not consider the economy and the economic consequences. But at the same time, you have to move toward uh, more consideration of these other variables. And so uh, you're correct to point out that it's not only about food and water security, it's about health security, heat stress, all these other kinds of things. There are a number of other things to consider that are related to, to climate variables. And you should be working toward having a more comprehensive strategy of dealing with all of them. Um, but uh, you know how to, how to map those steps out is very difficult. But again, I'll go back to uh, stakeholder engagement and with the ministries and with the, the, the national organizations to try and uh, to take what they're already doing and help them to move forward. And you know sometimes that takes some some handholding or some some out you know some external funding or partnerships or cooperation with other countries. But I think that those are the steps that you have to take in order to gradually begin to move forward. Does the international community have a role here? I mean, I'm thinking of what's going on in Poland right now and the discussions that are going on. Is there something, is, is, is there a way that the international community can better um, partner with the Gulf region on some of these issues? Yeah, that may be a better question for Aisha, actually. But, uh, you know, I mean, the countries that, I, that I've been dealing in mostly, um, countries in Africa like uh, Niger and Sudan and Senegal and Ethiopia and then also Bangladesh and Vietnam, these are all kind of tropical countries that we're thinking of that are that are very much um, uh, at the mercy of climate variability in the tropics. And uh, so they, in each of these countries, you have uh, organizations like WFP or UN or other or, or, you know, FAO organizations that are going in and really working to try and, and help these nations with some of these kinds of issues. But it's a little bit different in, in the Arab Gulf states, right? So they're not and hurting so, for money. Yeah, right. And so they're not. <laughs> no, frankly. Yeah. <laughs> So they're not, they're, not as, they're not as dependent on the, you know, the international sources of, of uh, financing to be able to deal with some of these kinds of things. But I, I think that there, there should be, yeah. and, and we should find some kind of a role to be able to, uh, 
you know, better, or they should rather, to be able to better involve these international agencies, not so much from a funding point of view, I would say, but, but just from a cooperation point of view. That there's a lot to be gained from that. I, I was just going to say very briefly, I think one, one area in which, um, actually I think Gulf states, uh, for their own reasons, would be quite receptive to, to advice and support, um, is actually particularly in relation to the, to, the, to the water and food security question. So because of the growing gap, of course, between what they are able to produce domestically and what they have to import, as you know, there's been a surge of interest in, in Asia, but especially in Africa, in, in terms of trying to find places to invest it. Now, many Gulf investors um, have, have, have called feed or have all kinds of doubts about this. And I think to, to be able to help channel and, and, and contextualize and institutionalize some of that investment, which is both crucial in places like Ethiopia and Sudan or in Tanzania, uh, for boosting agricultural productivity, which is sorely needed, there's no, no bigger problem in those countries for poverty reduction as well as adapting to climate change than the question of agricultural productivity. And to do so in a way that doesn't disempower locals, that doesn't just push them off the land and, and, and push them to cities where they form ever-growing slums, but in ways that actually boost rural incomes that make these people indeed able to, to resist shocks, as historically in many cases they've been able to do. I mean, for example, a country like Sudan is a great example. Sudan in the 60s and the 70s went through a series of horrific droughts, but nobody in Sudan died. Because Sudan had a series of, 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 of adaptive mechanisms by which it was able to cope with extraordinary climate viability. That's higher actually than what we're experiencing at the moment. What, is, what has changed in Sudan is that there's, a, that there's a, has been a weakening, some would say even by the government, deliberate weakening, of some of the communal and social mechanisms that exist in those countries. If we can partner with Gulf countries that make sure that the kind of investments, the kind of funding they provide in those states actually helps build the resilience and makes these people uh, more able to, to voice their concerns, to have impacts on how markets function, the way they deal with the state, some of that goes into fiscal policy as well, that would be a majorly positive contribution. And Gulf countries may be interested in it if for no other reason that A, it would boost their food security, and B, it would be a great PR thing. It would be, it would be seen to be doing a, a good thing, and they would be getting some credit for that. And, and that may be one very concrete way in which they may be able to help in those places that need it the most. Thank you. I'm going to add one thing. In terms of seeking of the inter uh, international fund in the Gulf countries, I think from my reading about the uh, national determined contribution, the Gulf countries doesn't make it conditional that we would pursue uh, climate change mitigation adaptation if we got specific funding. Maybe the Gulf countries need to be, as uh, Harry mentioned, in a position to be a donor rather than receiver. <laughs> A lot of it, it all comes down to funding, but, but it's not just about funding. And I, and no. I, and I, and I, li I like the thought about there are, there are win-wins here, and I feel like we don't spend enough time looking for them. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say that I, I think I touched on it briefly, but it, it's, it's kind of another way that they can think of as diversifying, is to be investing uh, in other countries, not only from a, a food imports point of view, but just in a general cooperative point of view, and that they will uh, reap benefits from that, you know, from a, a publicity point of view yeah, in one way. But also... Uh, as Aisha was saying. So um, I think it's really important that, uh, that those kinds of, of coalitions are developed and that we can gradually begin to move forward with some of these collaborative efforts. Yeah. So I think you guys didn't come just to hear us all talk up here. So yeah, I'll start <laughs> to take questions. Hi. Looks like you got your hand up first. Uh, Rachel, oh, sorry. Uh, Rachel Ziemba, um, I wanted to pick up on that international point. Um, and, and maybe push you guys a little bit on some of the publicity um, around the foreign investments that's already happening, particularly the role that some of the sovereign wealth funds uh, have done in signing up to the One Planet initiative. And there's been a lot of speculation about whether that's just a, a green stamping, <laughs> if we can sort of call it that. I mean, it's also, in my view, kind of part of a broader institutional investor shift to um, there is actually there are actually benefits of in, of uh, investing of, of thinking about the carbon and environmental costs of portfolios over the longer term, but I'm wondering if any of you have any thoughts about whether um, any of those considerations, sort of one planet or the like, are trickling down into the local policy uh, dynamics. Um, uh, I mean, I guess that's something that many of us, myself included, are watching for closely as we've seen these roll out. So. How do you think at all, the, whether the, the sovereign development funds or the sovereign wealth funds um, might, might play a role in some, of these, uh, in some of these partnerships that you all have just been talking about? And, and thanks, this was a, a great uh, session. Yeah. 
Um, I mean, from what I've seen, and this is mostly from my work in, in East Africa, I, I can't talk about the, uh, the world as a whole or even the developing, the developing world as a whole, but I mean, it, it's important that they've, they've signed up exactly because in the past there was so little consideration of any of these, of any of these issues. Um, I mean, the, the, the truth is that the, that the track record of Gulf investment in, in agriculture in, in East Africa and in Sahelian Africa is fairly disastrous. It's environmentally disastrous. It was financially disastrous. It was bad investment. Um, it helped empower, I think, the wrong people politically. As I said, it, it in many ways helped to decrease the resilience of a number of local societies rather than increase them. Um, so in that sense, it's welcome. The question is indeed whether it is more than uh, just these sovereign wealth funds following the advice of a number of American and British consultants who have told them it's important to do that, and that's part of what a modern sovereign wealth fund does, and therefore you sign and whether it actually means that, that the way in which some of these, these investments are, are managed are actually changing. Now, um, I haven't seen that. I mean, I've, in, in my discussion with, with Gulf investors, for example, in, in Sudan or in Eritrea, um, I've never seen anyone mention that. And that worries me somewhat. The, the, the extent to which this, they talk about the environment is usually, is there going to be enough water? Um, and yeah, that's as, as you know better than I. That's not really an environmental conversation. Uh, so, um, so in, in that sense, I, th I think it, it's good that people like yourself are, are 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 focusing and hopefully generating some more pressure. Because I my 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 sense is that it's it's not much more so far, at least from what I've seen, than uh, than than the signing up rather than any any concrete implementation. But perhaps other panelists have other views. Um, yeah, it is. It is really. Um uh, uh, an important point uh, in the way we look at how the, those um, climate, uh, one planet, and other related things are translated in the, at the local level. Uh, one of the reasons w why I mentioned uh, the need to uh, integrate the climate science in, in the education was because of this. Um, as Harry mentioned, uh, those uh, global issues somehow I'm not gonna re uh, generalize, but somehow they are looked at as global issues um, because uh, it is the same thing when we look at the way of the um, electricity and the water consumption in the region. And uh, um, the Gulf countries is among us uh, the highest in the world in terms of the energy consumptions in per capita basis. Um, and that is uh, really linked to this uh, idea. Uh, is this impact is tangible to me or not? Um, it is not felt in that way, perhaps at the moment, but I'm sure it's going to change. It started actually to change in the Gulf countries. Um, especially, maybe it depends on what driver it, it would make it change. It, not only in the Gulf, it also happens like in the India and in China, what is driving the climate action really is the air pollution. And in the Gulf countries, the recent drop in the oil prices have actually contributed in this push to uh, change the, uh, the behavior and feeling the impact of uh, our actions uh, and uh, changing the responsibilities of the people um, on the, I mean, in the countries. Thanks. Anyone else have questions? Thanks. Hi, I'm Kristen Diwan. I'm here at the Arab Gulf States Institute. Um, I wanted to kind of just uh, maybe in some ways emphasizing things that you've already said, but just uh, reemphasize this uh, argument that climate change is really hard uh, in the environment of the Gulf, um, or particularly because of the whole conversation about you know, the, the carbon industries, hydrocarbon industries, and, and their central role in this whole story. Um, and I was just thinking about what's happening in Poland right now, and of course that initial climate change report, the hard report that came out, and it's not surprising then that we see the two countries, the few countries that came out against it were Russia, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait, and then the U.S. joined them, all states that have really strong hydrocarbon in interests. Um, so I guess I'm just wondering, I mean, uh, given that, um, given the strong position that those, those states took, um, 
I don't know what my question is. I guess I guess one of them is, um, so maybe we should look at the states who didn't sign up for that. So so Saudi Arabia and Kuwait did. Um, so I'm trying to just think of, of, of levers of, of how we can find kind of positive examples, even when in this hard context. So I know, Aisha, you've been looking a bit at Oman, and you, you mentioned UAE, perhaps, of countries that have been able to break a little bit out of this kind of more one-to-one -one thinking about, you know, that this is damaging to us because our main livelihood is, is linked to this, and so we just have to stand against the whole climate change uh, arena. Uh, so maybe you give us some examples of, of maybe, you know, not to neglect the sub-state things, but, but why are some states taking a better position on this and why you think that might be? And then I'm kind of curious about other levers because we do get some kind of weird, odd mixed messaging. Like if we look at Saudi Arabia right now, they're very much trying to put forth this image, you know, that we're kind of becoming more modern, we're linked in with this uh, new generation concerns. And if you look at the Crown Prince's uh, probably premier um, big project that he's trying to promote is this uh, Neom, like this new city, right? And if you look at the, if you look at the advertising for Neom, it's all very much this whole, you know, it's a pristine environment, beautiful, you know, live at one with nature. So it kind of has, and, and even the way they're presenting al Ulatu, I mean, maybe in, in practice what they're doing isn't like that, but the language is still very much about this kind of concern for these sorts of living within your environment, appreciation for that and the means. Is there anything to leverage in that or should we just be completely cynical about it? Yeah, so um, I think well, whether the UAE can set the example or not, um, if we looked at the UAE, um, I think when I mentioned that we need to look at the climate change and economic diversification from one lens, um, I think um, the UAE <coughs> have started to do so because um, UAE has started to realize the importance of the economic diversification. And in fact, um, I can say like the UAE have been successful in this uh, expansion of the economic diversification. The oil and gas uh, contribution in the GDP is now, I think, less than 40. Uh, uh, and the non-oil sectors are co contributing by um, 60 or so. Um, and I think, um, and because of that, the UAE doesn't see the climate change as a threat. Uh, rather, it, it, it looks at it as an opportunity uh, in terms of uh, green investments. Um, the UAE has established, uh, I think it is called the Green Growth Strategy or so in 2014. Uh, whether that implemented, it sits really like nice strategies for each sector in the way how we reduce the emissions and how we uh, enable the other sectors. But whether it is implemented or not, I haven't follow up, followed up with the strategy. Um, and then the other thing in terms of uh, Saudi Arabia uh, and the other Gulf countries in terms of using the language of the largest project in the world. Um, I think the what is missing here is um, it is okay to to initiate projects, but what is missing is the the target actually and the strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some ambitious initiatives. Uh, they start, but then we don't see implementation. And I think what is missing here is the strategy on how to implement that. If I may very quickly, what's also missing is the people. What's always striking if you see images of the new cities, you see lots of buildings, you see lots of parks, you don't see people. You know, it reminds me of what Minister of Finance of a, of a particular country once to me said. He said, you know, the problem with uh, agriculture in my country is the farmer. If only we could have no farmers. And that's exactly the, that's exactly the thing. That, that so much of this is neat. Can we, can we make something new? Can we start tabula rasi? Can we start a new? Can we redesign? Can we retune? Rather than thinking, which is both economically more sensible, but of course politically a very different ballgame. How can we restructure? How can we how can we fix? How can we locally grow? How can we do that? And so my I I I hope indeed that we, <laughs> we would be able to use some of the promises and some of the language 
um, to, to, to compel people who otherwise are, are recalcitrant or are interesting. But as always, I'm, 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 I'm very worried when people indeed, again, present climate change or agricultural change or economic effects without the people. That's, that's, that's the, the single most important thing that's missing. And that, but that's not a coincidence that they're missing. I'm Mustafa Rion from the Washington Institute, uh, visiting from Israel. I guess that's my hang word. Um, I think that uh, much is, has to do with framing. So is it really an environmental climate change issue? Or is it a first-rate uh, leadership challenge in a adaptive leadership? Because you go to a doctor and he says, you're overweight, you're about to die. And your diet is terrible because you eat mostly carbon fossils. Uh, so there need to be a detoxication pro uh, program. It's a different stabilization system of governments. It needs to cast, cut across borders. By the way, people are migrating through your area, so they're bringing you uh, new stuff. Um, there's a lot of oxygen sucked into regional issues. So maybe it's more important to fight the uh, uh, neighbors than to fix your own. Uh, a lot of values left untapped on the table. So could you talk to the opportunities there, not on the technical level, because I don't think that's uh, the environmental uh, ministries that are the problem. It's a sustainability problem. It's a stability problem. It's a regime survival problem for whatever so h how do you see that uh, play out? At the same time, when you're competing with China on food security in Africa, well, good luck, buckle up. <laughs> That's a question of size. Uh, so h how, how do they each, you know, each uh, is miserable in, I in its own unique way? How do they each contend with this problem set? I think you make uh, some excellent points, and one of uh, one of them is that um, you know if you set aside any kind of climate change or other uh, problematic trends, there are some uh, fundamental problems you know at root that have to do with governance and sustainability, and these problems need to be addressed as well as the trends, and that they're really uh, inextricable. I mean, you know, they're they're linked, and they and they must be, and they must all be dealt with in a comprehensive way. Uh, it's not always so straightforward how exactly we go about doing that because it's a very complex, multivariate in time and space problem. But at the same time, I think that it's it's very important. It kind of it kind of reminds me of the the recent really severe multi-year drought in California. I was doing my postdoc at, at UCSB and I was there for two years and it was kind of in the height of the drought, and everyone was kind of saying what we really need is a big El Nino because in a big El Nino year. We'll get a lot of rain and the drought will be washed away and it's kind of very instructive of this i think because it doesn't address the fundamental problem which is an unsustainable water policy yeah right exactly but but that's a that's a real communication problem that has to be overcome and it and speaks to the communication and the the education and everything else uh, about the climate variability but also the, the need to address the root problems in addition to the, the climate problems. Uh, yes, Steve Satcher from the AGSIW. One of the things we've seen here in, in our own country is kind of our industry and entrepreneurs moving at, oh, I'm sorry, uh, I should know this by now. Um, we're, we're working at counter purposes with our government. Our government says we're going to reduce mileage requirements on automobiles, and the industry says no, we're going to make more, more, you know, electric cars and higher mileage cars. Um, is, are there phenomena like that elsewhere in the world where governments are slow to, to uh, enact these measures, but industry entrepreneurs are saying no, no, the tide is clear, the, the future is in one direction, and we're going to continue to create green industries and this and this kind of enthusiasm continues to undercut government measures and, in fact, turns governments around to create policies that are more in sync with what they see the economy doing. Perhaps one thing, going back to what Aisha is saying, I think, indeed, one, one source of optimism 
is indeed that you do see uh, a bit of a shift, or at least at least rhetorically, perhaps also in practice, towards towards private sector and towards smaller and medium sized enterprises. Um, and of course, the the very nature of a number of renewable energy systems is that they are more decentralized, and that they, therefore they militate against the kind of top down centralized approach that has come with with fossil fuels. It's not a coincidence that authoritarianism and fossil fuel production often map onto each other so well. There's there's reasons to that with the with the nature of of technology and the institutions built around them. So, I th I think I think we're right to hope that. Um, that as the private sector would increasingly find spaces to push forward a number of initiatives, sometimes because certain people in the Ministry of Finance or the Central Bank may think, oh, well, that's you know, not, not that important, let these guys do something. And that by the nature of innovation and by the nature of what they do, they could, they, they could help change some of the consumption patterns we're talking about. But whether we're actually then seeing them, that translate into changed government policy, um, certainly, not in, certainly not in the Gulf, uh, also not from what, what I've seen in, in, in the African context, um, I, I think that that's really what we should be hoping for, uh, that, 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 that then companies, ordinary people, civil society organizations take up the role where governments are failing. Uh, but I'm not sure that, that, that we actually have very successful examples or large-scale examples of that. I don't know if anything else comes to mind. Yeah, so I think it is um, a combination of two. Um, what is signaling the private investors and the entrepreneurs to go and invest in the green market? And it also depends on the government on the other side, whether the government is providing the incentives and opening up the market for the Gulf countries, um, especially in the electricity sector. It is, um, we, we see a lot of state-owned enterprise in the electricity sector. We see monopolized uh, electricity uh, systems in there. Uh, the market is not ready to actually absorb those uh, new entrants and investors. Um, however, I saw this uh, recent drop in the uh, oil prices again. It actually pushed for some uh, reforms in the electricity sectors. It pushed for privatization uh, uh, in the electricity sector. For example, Oman is doing a gradual privatization of the um, electricity companies, uh, both the suppliers and the distributors. In a way, it would, in a near future, uh, in enable the in introduction or the entry of those newcomers. Um, what is also happening in Oman, I think they are doing it very gradually in terms of integrating renewable energy. Uh, that is because renewable energy technologies has a lot of uh, uncertainty about it, uh, around it. Uh, for example, there are concerns about the efficiency of the technology. Uh, there are concerns uh, whether the technology is going to meet the demand or not. So um, the way it has been done, uh, the government started first with um, uh, uh, um, uh, a policy called SAHEM, which uh, allows the um, customers to install the solar uh, panels in the rooftops. Um, but at the first stage, there wasn't any funding. So it was kind of a learning process for the government and for the customers themselves. So there wasn't really that huge incentive for the uh, investors to go and invest at the beginning. Uh, some of the people invested, yes, because they have the, the willingness to invest, but then from that stage, the government learned like in the next stage, maybe we need, uh, and there was actually a, a survey between the government and the, uh, the, the, the customers on what, the, what would incentivize you to um, invest in renewable energy, and most of the people said it is about uh, the, the cost. Uh, it is very expensive to in invest in that. And so the second stage is going to be uh, to um, provide uh, provide funding for those who want to. Uh, so I think the problem here, we we have the private sector on one hand, we have the government, and but they complement each other. Yeah, I'll add just a quick point to that. And that's that I, I think often the governments and sort of private sector technology entrepreneurs are in sort of a complicated dance. Um, ultimately, what wins is economics. 
you need to be able, entrepreneurs need to be able to make money selling a product. And people use that product, it needs to be economic for them. When that happens, everybody moves forward. And so if government's going to push a particular technology, being it for clean energy reasons or some other reason, they need to see, at the very least, a path towards that becoming economic. And so there's, the, the, there's a complex relationship between entrepreneurs pushing forward, maybe even if policy doesn't support it now, because they either see a path towards being economic or they see a path towards being economic enough for it to be something that government is interested in. And so I think you sometimes see pushing forward mm -hmm even when the government is not going that direction for a couple different reasons. One of them, if they, if they think the government situation is temporary, which I would argue a lot of people here in the states see with, with our climate policy, or if they see it sort of a clear path towards being economic and where they don't need government anymore. Yeah. Both of those are um, good arguments for pushing forward, even if the government is not really on your side right now. Anybody else, thoughts, comments, questions? So actually, just to kind of feed off feed off that, so if we think about what's happening in the U.S., the displacing of coal, or the displacing of coal is largely because solar and wind have become very attractive from an economic standpoint. So if you think about like you know Saudi Arabia and the fact that you know they're producing nine dollar barrel oil, the cost of generation is just so unbelievably low. Um, I don't even know how you know renewables could could compete with that. You know, even if you do have a free market. I'll take that one for a second, and that is, you, in that instance, you don't necessarily look at the, at the cost of producing that oil or natural gas. You look at the opportunity cost of selling it somewhere else. Right. And that's when I, when I used to work in Saudi, um, I would make the mistake and use the S word, which was subsidies. And they're like, no, those aren't subsidized pro prices. Those are, um, what was the word they used? Administered prices, I think, was the, was, the, was the word that was favored. And because they weren't actually subsidized. They were below the cost of production. But the opportunity cost of doing something else with that is much higher. And so if you look at it in that way, things become more competitive. Yeah. Is that, do you agree with that? Yeah. Actually, what the, the increased investments on renewable energy in the Gulf, we have seen uh, it was so increasing after the 2014 because of the drop in the oil prices. And the, the driver was mainly to free more natural gas into the market. Because uh, in the Gulf themselves, there is increased uh, consumption and it's still increasing in an exponential way. Uh, I mean, the domestic demand for the natural gas and the electricity and the water, which also depends on the desalination. So that was an opportunity to sell. So it makes sense to sell uh, the natural gas and to invest in the renewable energy. Right, going once. <laughs> well, just, just to do a quick summary of, what, of, of what's been said here, I mean, the primary thing that I took away from this is that we tend to think of climate change for the Gulf countries in terms of it being an energy issue and related to the oil industry. But, it, but it's not just that at all. It's really existential for them. And um, we know that existential issues are really hard to deal with. But I mean, it comes down into, I mean, it obviously comes down to the core of many of their economies, but it also comes down into the relationship of governments with people, as, as Harry described. Um, about about it's about security and not just economic security, but other kinds of security. And so I think it really helps to 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 think about these countries uh, through a wider lens than just looking at oil, so, uh, just looking at climate change through the lens of oil. So I'd like to thank Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington for putting this on. I'd like to thank Harry and Colin and Aisha for coming, and um, all of you for coming and for your listening and for your questions.